Dear boss, make a decision. I'll probably get a lot of nods if I ask this question. Um, has anyone told you, an examiner, a colleague, say, do not say the phrase I could do, do not say my options are. And it, it's, it's, it's something that I was told constantly through my training. Um, because when, you, when you're first, in your first two years of, of training, it's all about the options. Your first part is all, all, all about giving all the different categorizations of hypoxemia or hypovolemia or whatever it is, and then going into some detail. But this exam is about knowing those options and definitively choosing one of them. So again, this exam is about knowing all those options, but you don't have to talk through them. This is about decision-making and judgment calls. So let's run through some decision-making for this exercise. What would you do in this situation? So I want you all to think about this 30-year-old G2P1 female for an elective Caesar uh, at 39 weeks. It's a known grade four airway by a consultant, no mention of bag mask or LMA, five years ago and has gained 30 kilos since. Let's say this patient is now 110 kilos um, with a BMI of let's say 40, 43 or something like that. What do you do? So what would I do? I would probably put in a, I would put in a CSC on this patient. I would have a CMAC and digital airway. Sounds good. By as well as a flexible, I, I'm going to stop you there. Uh, See, you rightly said CSC. I think that's what most people would like to do knowing what's about to happen here. You're, you, you're unable to place the CSE. What would you do? Use an ultrasound to image the back to see if I can improve my view and increase my ability to place a neuraxial. You try, you do that, and you reattempt the CSE, and you still can't find the space for whatever reason. And, and note that I, I'm just being annoying, right? But I, I really yeah. want to push you towards something. So um, keep going. Sure. So if uh, if I cannot perform a CSE, I will have one final attempt at performing a straight spinal anaesthetic. Uh, yep. If I'm unable to do this, I'm going to plan to do uh, an intubation. Let's say you can definitely do the spinal anesthetic, but then on further history, you find out that the spinal wore off as they were closing the skin in the delivery of the last, last baby, which is a Caesar as well. Does that change what you do? I would, so this is a risk benefit discussion and I would have this discussion with the patient as well as with the obstetrician. Fantastic. And I'd be wanting to know some more information about their previous uh, um, a Caesar, so whether that was performed by a trainee, whether it was particularly long Caesar, and what kind of dose they put in the spinal anaesthetic. Great. Right. And get... that would help me make a decision as to what I'm going to do next. Sounds good. Uh, let's say they put a standard dose, let's say 2.2 mils of heavy 0.5% bupivacaine plus 15 mics of fentanyl. It was done by a consultant uh, obstetrician, and the Caesar was completed in a reasonable time, let's say, let's say an hour. So in that case, I think considering that last time all of the factors were probably comp uh, were um, optimised in terms of uh, the length of the block and the uh, speed of the surgery. I think in this case, the safest approach is going to be to electively intubate this patient after having a discussion with the surgeon and the patient yep. about the reasons why. How would you go about intubating the patient? Carefully. Um, so <laughs> I would ensure that I have a skilled assistant and a skilled anaesthetic nurse um, I would optimise my positioning for intubation. Just to clarify, you're, you're, you're not, you're not doing... I have a video ringoscope and I'd have a flex flexible uh, bronchoscope nearby, as yep. well as all my airway adjuncts. So just to clarify, you're not doing an awake fibro optic, you're doing a general yes. anaesthetic? Okay, good. Um, can I just get a show of hands? Would anyone do an awake fibro optic considering the situation we're in now? Okay, oh. good. And who would go ahead with a, just an induction? And by the way, I'm not saying that any answer is right. I'm just getting you to a pointy end of a decision which no one on the planet is comfortable with, right? Um, you know, awake fiber optics are you know, r rare enough and it's, it just feels a bit irksome to do that in this situation. Personally, I'll, in, given that situation, I'd probably do an awake fiber optic because that feels like the right, right thing to do in, in such a, such a high-risk environment. But you're not wrong in saying what you did because what I'd suggest people to do is to go to each consultant that they work with and they trust and say, what would you do in this situation? Anyway, next part here, let's say you were about to do an induction and then um, the patient says they really, 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 really want to be awake for delivery. Uh, does that change your plan? I, I don't think it's going to change my plan. Um, I think it just means that I need to have a further discussion with the patient so that they understand the complexity of the situation. Yep. Uh, and I need to acknowledge their desire to be awake for the delivery and that that is a completely reasonable thing to want to do for the birth of your baby. Mm -hmm. But that for the safety of the patient, um, that this is what we need to do to keep her safe. Yeah, sounds good. So I think the take home message here is that you're gonna, you can make any situation a very, very difficult situation where you are damned either way 
And I think it's really the most important part of that is being able to make a decision. Because trust me, in this Fiverr, you will get, you know, occasionally get this kind of crazy situation. One of my colleagues before me had a situation of a wake fiber optic in a known grade four or impossible airway who's allergic to all uh, allergic to all local anesthetics. You know, obviously a really tough situation. And, and this exam isn't one where you can reasonably postpone things. Because again, this exam, if, if someone could postpone as an answer, as a general rule, it, it, doesn't, dif it doesn't differentiate between candidates. It, it, this exam is generally speaking one that requires you to proceed with something and mitigate risks. That said, let's go through this example. So uh, what, I've, what I've just done there is a, is a particular technique that I think is really worthwhile. Uh, you can supersize any scenario to make it difficult. Like that initially wasn't that difficult, but we just added on complexity after complexity. So imagine that you do maybe 500 cases a year and maybe a few of them will be really difficult. Um, but when you do your Viva practice, you, you wanna be training that muscle constantly. So add complexity to your scenario when you're training with your colleagues and uh, when you're doing Viva practice with your colleagues uh, to just help work that decision-making muscle. So let's start with this one, an 80 year old male, cataract surgery uh, in just a small private hospital, stable, NYHA3 heart failure, cardiac extent 10 years ago on clopidogrel, uh, which wasn't C, so clopidogrel is continued, diabetic, hypertensive, cholesterol, ex-smoker, exercise tolerance. The surgeon requests a peribulbar block for cosmetic reasons which is quite common in private. What do you do? So for this patient on clopidogrel, um, I wouldn't be comfortable to do a peribulbar block. Mm -hmm. And um, so I would have that conversation with the surgeon mm -hmm. um, about other options, which would be um, for me to do a subtenon block mm -hmm. or alternatively for um, sort of topical local anaesthetic drops only or um, the surgeons or the ophthalmologists to place intracameral local anaesthetic using their microscope. Um, I guess, as we've discussed, it's all risk benefit, but cosmetic reasons uh, wouldn't be enough for me to justify doing this. Yeah, good. And having a firm stance on that in difficult situations is, is almost easier in the Viva than actually in private, in, in your private career in the future. But absolutely, knowing all the different options there are, and you may get to a point where the surgeon goes, no, 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 or the examiner goes, no, you must do a perivalva. I think it's, I think there's many different angles you can take. And I like the example that you took that cosmetic reasons are really not a valid reason in in our culture, in our medical climate to do anything. But that said, you could also ask a panel of your the consultants around you and say, who would do a peribulba on clopidogrel? And there is evidence that the increase of you know bleeding does you know does rise, but the fact that there are plenty of people doing doing peribulbas on clopidogrel and anticoagulation, and the fact that the absolute increasing risk is still very small. So again, you could probably go ahead with a peribulba based on what I know of you know, common practice in Melbourne. Uh, but again, you, you could, I feel like you could talk through this either way. And it's, it's about being able to talk through that decision to sound, you know, sound smart, sound like a consultant that, that allows you to get through this because often there isn't a right or wrong answer and there's quite a massive variance of practice. How about this one? A five-year-old boy for emergency super